Okay, hi guys. Uh, I see that I'm super tiny on the screen and I'm looking more at your screen than uh, me, but uh, I'm just gonna put on the PowerPoint uh, and, uh, and play a movie or two and then uh, I'll come back in and I'll do a full screen so I could be uh, mammoth in size and you can see how sexy I look uh, extra big. Uh, I'm super glad to be here and thank you very much for the invite. And I know uh, being in New York uh, and not there is definitely a problem because so many of you are, are good friends and colleagues that I respect. Uh, but I had to, I, I have to almost clone myself because I'm technically now in another meeting at the same time. So I'm doing this and I'm devoting all the time I can and I'm ready for this discussion to be uh, super amazing. So let me start here with a video that shows some of our work uh, that we do at Terraform One here in Brooklyn, New York. And I think this kind of explains uh, the different disciplines and, and different groups that we're involved with uh, in each and every project, with, which is super different every time. Let's see if this can play. In the next 100 years, we can expect human population to reach 11 billion people. Is this something that is sustainable? The largest amount of people on this planet Earth live inside this circle. We use the Buckminster Fuller Dymaxion map to take a view of the world and look at the 25 densest cities on the planet Earth. Our biomap displays population density as a parametric graph on the front. The back zooms in on each of these cities designed and built and grown inside petri dishes. We chose colonies of E. coli as a method of demonstrating exponential population growth. Population density was represented in two different forms of fluorescent E. coli. Red represented future projections of population density, while green represented existing conditions you would find in cities. Biology is technology. Genetic modifications of benign strains of E. coli were carried out at Genspace, the world's first community-based biotech laboratory. Genes cloned from bioluminescent oceanic animals, such as jellyfish and coral, were introduced to bacteria by transformation. These genes encoded information that would enable our transform microbes to synthesize either GFP or RFP, two brightly fluorescent proteins. The transformed E. coli were then incubated overnight on petri dish plates containing agar-based media with antibiotics to select our genetically modified strains. Individual bacteria divided through repeated population doublings to produce colonies containing millions of cells. Each selected cell now expressed our clone proteins. We then used high-speed centrifugation to concentrate our colonies of transgenic E. coli. Stencils derived from CAD files would shape the E. coli into specific geometries that would show or display the current conditions in cities. We wanted to move away from the current paradigm of studying population through computation. We wanted a different method to explore how humans might affect the earth. Cartographers, urban planners, biologists, and architects, all working to think about a map of the near future of human population. So that's, uh, that's kind of um, a general look at uh, the different folks that uh, are involved in the spaces that we operate in. We've been doing this for some time at Terraform One. We're a 501c3 nonprofit that's built for research and research is uh, uh, mostly what we do, uh, but it's, it's not just in architecture, it's, it branches out into many different fields. And after doing this for uh, a number of years, since 2006 at the Metropolitan Exchange, we 
took this work to the Brooklyn Navy Yard, which is shown here between the Manhattan Bridge and the Williamsburg Bridge. Uh, it's over 300 acres of urban space, and we had done something called an unfeasibility study, which was looking at what could happen to the Brooklyn Navy Yard if there was uh, no limit uh, as far as a client or developer side, and that the community's input and the, the kind of the representation of what's happening in Brooklyn now sort of came to the Navy Yard and uh, sort of exploded into a bright burning star of activity. So we, uh, we made a proposal and we got a $46 million grant to get this building that you see here with David Belt and Macro C. And Terraform worked on curating the different groups that would be in here. And we had a beta space and had a vision for creating what we moved from before, which was maker spaces. I think maker spaces were born in Brooklyn uh, with uh, the New York City Resistors and Alpha One Labs and the Metropolitan Exchange. We want to move from maker spaces to creating this, which is a maker village. Uh, and we found our, our offices inside here now, and we're good for the next 31 years, which is the lease. And you can see it's right there on the Brooklyn waterfront. It's in an area that is devoted to making and industry, which is getting smaller and smaller in the footprints in our cities today. We have uh, uh, high-end uh, uh, machines for uh, tooling other machines. Mills, seven axes mills, multi axis robot arms, water jet cutters, uh, wood shop, metal shop, areas for ideation and discussion and critique, areas for assembly and building, areas for uh, private offices, uh, and areas to get coffee. It was really important that people here in this lab meet each other, talk about what's going on, and get to that level of synergy so that we can do some real invention, some real innovation. We are the only architecture office there. Uh, I, well, again, we're not exactly an architecture office, but we're the only ones doing architecture. We used to be with uh, David Benjamin and The Living. Uh, those guys had to move out for other reasons, and they're actually uh, in another part of New York. Uh, but it's super exciting to be embedded with robotics companies, people doing nanotech, people doing farming, uh, et cetera. So we also do a lot of teaching when we're there. We started something called the One Lab, which is a, an informal school where we show each other things that you couldn't normally get uh, in courses or courses that aren't available in the university level. So here is Carlos Roberto Sperios. He did his PhD at MIT uh, with me, and he's teaching scientists how to do parametric modeling in this workshop. Here is Oliver Medvedic. Uh, he is a, a biologist. He runs the Kembar Center for Biological Engineering at Cooper Union, and he's teaching architects and designers how to do biology. These are some of uh, our students in the classes that we're, we're teaching, where they're building their own thermoformer, learning how to make their machines in a very DIY fashion, and then producing products from those machines, or rooftop uh, gardening. So we do all different types of, of farming on roofs. Uh, here we're looking at uh, uh, growing trees into a, a lattice network. These are poplar that get grafted and fitted together. Or different soil types. This is a pectin impregnated clay based soil that goes on rooftops, especially when roof loads are really important. And that's uh, Walter Meyer, a landscape architect, teaching the class. We're also teaching how to do all the green stuff we talk about. So we do have green thumbs, we get dirty. Here we're creating a phytoremediation dam, which takes gray water from your sink and processes it naturally on an incline, which is something we often spec as you know designers, but it's not something that one would necessarily uh, do at a one-to-one -one scale. So here's one of the, the kind of propositions where these things come together from teaching and doing uh, this is a, a thought about uh, a, a near future city where all of these technologies are off the shelf and readily available, but applied together and integrated. So concepts here, such as removing cars from streets is a big one, uh, replacing them with light rail, uh, privileging pedestrian access to as many spaces as possible, vertical uh, farms to harvest food, and also uh, vertical plantings for air quality and some level of automation and maintenance to take care of them. And uh, uh, wind turbines, uh, photovoltaics built into buildings, 
and uh, running through the center of the street is a riparian corridor that accepts all kinds of aqueous life as opposed to uh, uh, antiquated sewage systems. So all of these things become to us the idea of the smart city and the socio-ecological city, which is very much about putting biology back uh, uh, or nature back in, in cities and making it work and showing the public that uh, there's a rationale for doing that. We also do make a lot of these um, community-based uh, models from workshops that then go on display in galleries and museums. But this is working with folks in Red Hook and downtown Brooklyn and Governor's Island and merging fantasies of what they see their future neighborhood should be like as a, a kind of a larger project to unpack. But essentially, we often uh, bring other voices to the table and other stakeholders besides the usual folks like government or folks in development. We also spend a lot of time commuting, uh, sorry, communicating metabolic flows in cities. What is, what is this, the actual stuff of life in cities and what is its consequence? So waste is a very big topic that we work with. Here is looking at something we call one hour tower. This is 36,000 tons of trash per day in the city of New York, but this is only one hour's worth of it, which is larger in mass and volume than the Statue of Liberty, even if it's compacted waste. We look at off the shelf technologies that actually do things or process things with waste, such as compaction, whether it's cardboard or plastic, organic or inorganic materials. We have uh, uh, thoughts about moving away from the age of industrialization and consumerism to an age of recovery where, where plastics are, or sorry, waste is thought of as a, a constant uh, upcycling routine. Uh, it is more than just cradle to cradle, but it's actually moving from creativity to creativity to creativity. Nothing is thrown away. Everything is upcycled or up-leveled to eventually we move into a positive waste society where there is no waste. And that everything is pre-designed to anticipate its next step in a life cycle. We take these notions and bring them out to uh, events. This one was done for the Idea City uh, with the new museum and also commissioned by the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It's showing how much styrofoam we throw out in New York City. And this is just a 30 second flash. So we made a folly that was meant to be uh, sort of disrupted or dismantled uh, after the time period is put together. I will say that one of the things we learned is that Seven-year-old boys can be extremely violent, and they're also very efficient at uh, dismantling almost anything. Uh, uh, this project, we called it the Ice Star. We moved to other cities and done similar versions of this. This was in Darmstadt, asking them how much waste the city produces, which filled up a gymnasium, actually a room basically the size of the room you guys are in. And they made these little Wally-like robots that were deployed throughout the city. So people can confront the waste that they are producing. There's QR tags so they can learn about the waste and how much is made and perhaps do something about it. This one was a 38-foot a, a styrofoam structure. Here it is in the, the kind of center square with many of these other pieces. Uh, we had folks from uh, the sanitation crew deciding whether they were garbage or art or garbage or art, which was pretty, pretty interesting to see. Eventually, they decided it was garbage, uh, which is unfortunate for us. But we ran out there and said, please don't throw it away uh, and invited them to our art opening and told them about, you know, waste in cities. Although, however, they know about waste in cities. So it was a useless conversation. And then replacing uh, styrofoam with things like this. Many of you are familiar with mycelium. We've been working with mycelium for nine years plus. We have a R&D license with Ecovative. Here we are turning uh, mushrooms or essentially agricultural waste with reishi into a big a uh, uh, mushroom shape where the geometry is controlled by the scaffolding made from a plexiglass weld that is actually broken by the force of the growth of this mushroom material. We have gone on to shape mushrooms into all different forms. We called it mycoform. We've written a number of papers about that. Petri dishes that shape them into forms and combining them with other infinitely recyclable high embodied energy materials such as aluminum. So we have the mushroom material in the center, which is good for insulation and compaction. The aluminum adds tensile strength and shearing strength. And with just the amount of organic waste and aluminum waste we produce in the city of New York alone, that 36,000 tons, we could make a Chrysler building, a 53 story tower out of this method 
every single day in the city of New York from the stuff we throw out. Uh, if I was an alien looking down at the city of New York, I think New York was invented and many other cities to just toss things aside. I don't think we can keep on going at that rate. We also thought what else we can do with mycelium. So this is the entire history of furniture design in one little slide. But we're moving from old school bespoke crafted furniture in 19th century to, the, I guess, the beginning of time, Greece, Egypt, what have you, to the 20th century, which is about modularity, design for assembly, et cetera to the 21st century, which we see as a bioengineered century, where we grow things in labs, we test uh, elements of life, uh, whether it's at the genetic level or at full scale, we tweak or nudge life for purposes uh, or programmatic purposes that we see fit. Here we are combining the mushroom material with another material called acetobacter. Suzanne Lee, who's a friend, is known for her fashion work with acetobacter. It's essentially a, uh, a bacteria expressed cellulose. We created a novel biopolymer by wrapping the uh, fresh acetobacter on the mycelium and created a, a, a system that was very uh, hydro, uh, uh, hydrophobic and, and we thought could make into a chair. The geometry of the chair is another story. Uh, it could have been anything, uh, but we did have a parametric model and looked at many versions. We would need an evolutionary model, which I can probably talk about later, but essentially you would need a bunch of chairs fighting against food and mates and territory until one dominant chair species comes out of the primordial soup of the ocean, and that's what humans sit on. So that would probably be the form. Hox genetics, HOX genetics, is probably the only field that looks at directly at morphology and genetics and tweaking it at the, uh, the DNA scale. Uh, we're not yet, we don't have that availability at the desktop level. It's a picture of my daughter on the chair. That's a, a chair you can eat. Bringing it to a full scale, here we are seeding these uh, bamboo uh, ribbed components with uh, cotton husks and wood chips, essentially agricultural wastes, and feeding it with the mycelium and growing it in seven days to make these kinds of chairs, what we call a chaise lounge. So what we realized here is we have the first triply curved geometry made out of a living substance that is then petrified with no allergens, that can be used for acoustic tiling, uh, different architectural surfaces, and certainly something that uh, uh, one could sit on. Then other work I want to show is about uh, treating uh, biology uh, in, and mobility as a kind of a new design assignment for cities. So looking at cars or vehicle design inside cities and recognizing that the entire 20th century had been designed around the automobile. Uh, that's every city designed around cars. Why not make technologies uh, about mobility to fit cities themselves. So here is the entire car in a wheel, drivetrain, suspension, motoring. You add three or four wheels together and you get a car. And this one, uh, these were all done at work at MIT under Bill Mitchell, uh, where I was for four years doing future car projects and thinking about where ecology and vehicle design fit. So here's a car designed to stand up. It, the frame articulates, it reduces its footprint by 33%. You can park something like 300 of these stackable vehicles next to each other on a city block, as opposed to, uh, you know, 30 something SUVs, 40 SUVs, it's a drive by wire system. There's no mechanical linkages. It's a kind of Facebook on wheels. Uh, it's actually really designed to be stored because vehicles uh, designed today for basically 23 hours of, out of the day, they're not moving. Uh, so you just pick up this car, it takes two passengers, and you go where you need to and park it anywhere. Also looked at the material and the skins of these vehicles that would have points of aperture that would track wherever the driver was looking or where the sun is. And then thinking of new uh, morphological systems for the material base of car bodies or chassis. Here looking at uh, ETFE foil quilts, micro quilts, and air bladders making the cars as soft as possible so that they can move organically in flocks and herds of vehicles. This one uh, I've also done is called the Hug and Kiss Lamb Car. It is designed from the perspective that no one will ever die in a car accident again. It's okay to rub up against other cars or bump into them. The vehicles don't move 30 miles, more than 30 miles an hour, but that's actually the speed limit in Paris and New York and many cities. And you would move in this kind of uh, uh, municipally connected computational grid of these omnidirectional cars that are soft and huggable. And when they find a Hummer on the road, 
They actually cluster around it and they push that Hummer off the road as they take over the streets. And these cars are also uh, very intelligent and, and, and very capable uh, batteries on wheels that uh, are connected to that municipal grid and they can absorb peak demand and redistribute charge on the fly. So they can actually supplant our existing antiquated electrical grids in cities and think of it as a new layer that not only deals with mobility but deals with energy systems. We have designed these cars uh, also at Terraform for Shanghai and other places with dedicated lanes for faster mobility, parking and stacking on the streets, and then connected trains of cars that go from city to city. We have uh, actually have productized one of these vehicles, which you could purchase, although we've stopped doing that now, but it's called the Hiroku. It's a car that stands up, spins on a dime, and it's drive by wire. Uh, this was produced in Spain with Korean money. And then if it's not just about uh, vehicle design, it's also about thinking of, uh, you know, outside the cities or the peri-urban condition, which is uh, the suburbs. And, and, and here we wanted no distinction between urban dwellings and landscape, that all of these systems would be one contiguous metabolic uh, 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 form. And here where this project called Fab Tree Hab uh, integrates uh, uh, living matter uh, that has been shaped, intentionally shaped, to uh, be occupied for human space. We're using technologies that are 2,500 years old called pleaching or grafting inosculate matter together to form that one contiguous vascular system and scaffolds to shape these woody plants into uh, uh, a particular form. We don't need to use the old growth trees. They can attach to existing old growth trees and then just grow vines into a shape that's been predetermined by CNC scaffolding. Uh, here we are. Here's the model that we had done for show at the MoMA about prefabrication. I do know that it takes a modicum of time to grow these things. We do not accelerate it with any kind of genetics in, the, uh, in these versions. Uh, it's just nudging nature as it is into a shape. But if we can wait 10 to 12 years for a bottle of scotch, I think we can wait 10 to 12 years for a village that, ha that has a thousand homes for a thousand families that has a positive contribution on the environment cleans the air, it scrubs it, it produces oxygen, it considers the future of uh, people and the planet, not just uh, sprawling out and getting uh, more and more dwellings that have uh, extracted endless resources without consequence. Here is another version where we just think about some of the panel systems are living, uh, but otherwise it's a, a sustainable balloon frame construction, it's called Matscape. And then a version that we decide to turn into a product that uh, IKEA has uh, well, it has co-opted, I guess. Uh, this is called Urban Farm Pod. It's the scaffolding systems we use for the treehouse, except for they're turned into a sphere. It could be any, any dimension uh, from 18 feet to 4 feet. It's a rotegrity structure. So this rotegrity structure uh, is robotically milled and flat-packed and shipped to you. It is intended for urban environments, whether it's an urban park or a balcony or a rooftop or inside your house. Instead of a green wall, it is a green ball. So you have three times the surface area in these balls to grow food or plants for air quality. Uh, we worked with all different tests of geometries on, in this rotegrity sphere to find a sub-irrigation system and a planting system that would work with agravitational plants and plants in different daylighting conditions. Uh, here we do. Here we have a double skin system that's growing plants in all the different nooks and crannies of uh, these these articulated surfaces. Uh, we had looked at NASA's research on plants that would uh, essentially clean or scrub the air, and that worked uh, in the space shuttle and on the International Space Station. And also spirulina, which we used Arduino's to build models to test spirulina and grow it in our in our um, urban farm pod. And we tested for coloration, acidity, uh, uh, and uh, ripeness when it would be available and ready to drink. And uh, we built an app to tell you that. Uh, here it's showing the, the different uh, pods and, and connector points for spirulina or different grasses or foods or arugula. Oop, I don't know what happened there. Did I just go blank? I guess that was such a great image, it just disappeared. This is, uh, this is a, a version of it with uh, a wheat grass that's growing on it. It is part cabin, it is part farm, uh, and it's part furniture. 
So you can hang out on the inside and treat it like a sofa with two or three people, or you can grow more food on the interior. Uh, here you can see the sub-irrigation systems and the, the, the other side of the planters with their double skin systems working rather well. All of these things unfold and ship flat. So it's a little bit more complicated than a typical typical IKEA thing to assemble, uh, but that's okay. We can assemble it for you for an extra cost. Uh, this is our uh, one, our original bio lab that we had put together that now is GenSpace that has split off to become uh, 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 two other nonprofits. Uh, some other projects that we worked on, which was making 3D printers, combining with syringes so you can print cells into a specific geometry. Uh, David Rui had been doing this work and work that we had done previous to that, which is modifying inkjet printers. We teach a course on modifying inkjet printers to print cells into specified shapes. Normally it's made for uh, bladders here for patients who have cancer and after they, we need to make simple uh, flesh-like or skin-like structures that go inside a patient's body with their own cells. We thought we can take that same kind of system and make a uh, proposition for producing shoes or leather belts or handbags where no sentient creature is harmed, but all of these meat cells are, in this case, it's extracellular matrix from pigs, specifically swine, uh, is used to make uh, different products. We also ramped it up to the scale of a house as a thought experiment. I don't think I want to live in a giant dead pig, uh, but we, since we built the lab and we worked with the different materials and the, and the printing processes, we want to see how large you can get. And you could do something the scale of a house. And we, we're wrestling with the idea of how you would do doors and windows in a, in a giant dead uh, pig house. So we thought uh, mimicking sphincter muscles would be a great way to get in and out of this kind of home. Uh, I know this, those are cows uh, hanging around the extracellular matrix from pigs. It's okay, it's all one farm. Thought of this brilliant sort of new Frank Lloyd Wright 3.0 agenda where Broadacre City has pretty much grown. Uh, this is uh, one of the meat house uh, systems that we had produced. Only one small centimeter was grown uh, and then it was designed to die. We essentially curated with sulfates and nitrates. So it has a very long sh shelf life and has become extremely expensive beef jerky. It's about, uh, I think it was about $3,000 that one centimeter. Now it is a company called Modern Meadows, which got something like 40 million in Series A funding. And they're here in the new lab. Suzanne Lee is a part of it. And they're producing uh, in vitro based leather, just like our project here, for uh, consumers to use in a textile industry, be made into clothing. We decided to put the meat house in front of a cathedral in Prague where we had a big show so religion can confront it. And the last project I want to show, because I only have a half hour and I want to keep things uh, on time, is this, uh, uh, this belief in uh, rethinking food in cities. So we're always dealing with waste, uh, water, energy, mobility. Food is yet another problem we deal with. So here is one of my sexiest clients I've ever had in my life. This is a cricket, I guess, you know, Jiminy. And we worked with him for uh, a, a year or two on making the perfect habitat for him and then eventually eat him. This is the reason why we want to use crickets because they replace cows, pigs, chicken, lamb, etc. There's almost 2000 gallons less water when you grow protein for crickets than protein from cows. And it's about 300 times less carbon in the atmosphere depending on the animal, but around 100 times less when specifically cows, although buffalo is more. It's the same quality of protein you'd get from any other type of meat. It's got the same amino acid structure. It's a superfood. Crickets can feed cows. It can feed people. It could feed your cat. It could feed fish. It could feed birds. And the shelf life, when you grind them up into a flower, uh, is decades. So we didn't want to eat these bugs directly. We want to turn them into a flower because I don't like eating eyeballs and I don't like eating legs and wings. But once it's a flower, you can turn it into uh, a, a bonbon or a bagel or some pasta. We thought of the life cycle of these creatures, building parametric models for what we call these bio unit casings and house X amount of them. Roughly the number was about 200. If it's over 200, they get severely violent and they cannibalize each other. So we've come into the studio overnight and we've seen that they've basically killed each other. Uh, and one giant fat cricket is remaining, eating the corpses of the others. 
So uh, not the bet, not we didn't. We understand they are sentient creatures, and we want to work to find the best shelter system. Here is one done early on as an emergency sustenance-based farm. So it's one module that gets repeated, and you grow your crickets in a farm system. It can be deployed in any area that's just had a hurricane or a, or a, a massive fire where you don't have enough water for your animals, uh, and you barely have enough water for your family, and you need protein. And we worked on shelters that were much more elaborate and articulated for different site-based constraints and had a, a structural spawn system that, that certainly can be deployed, but takes a little bit more time when you consider uh, azimuth that angles and lighting and views. So these early models became you know, the Cricket Shelter project here. Each one of those, uh, each one of these modules has about 342 units with 200 crickets each. Every six weeks, you harvest your crickets and you could feed about 10 families uh, just from this shelter with the protein produced here. Uh, we were super excited to have this built full scale. We also looked at the modularity aspect of this. They can be repeated. The, uh, the, probably the, the best thing about it is that we don't use any land outside of a city. All of the city to grow our crickets is done inside urban spaces. So this certainly could, this is done on a dry dock in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, which, which, it, which it was produced. But you go from pasture to plate uh, or from farm to table almost immediately. So there's no carbon lost in the transportation of this protein. Also worked with a lot of chefs to help tune the flavor of the bugs themselves. So we were altering their body's metabolism. And at the Kembar Center, we're actually were changing their base genetics. So these are also genetically modified bugs uh, with the probiotics in their stomach so that they would express anti-aging uh, properties as well as vitamin A. Although we're not selling genetically modified bugs for you to eat right now, that's totally impossible for people in Europe and America to eat that. But 80% of the world eats bugs. We think if we built a system that's super hygienic and super clean uh, and sanitized and, and has the bugs reduced into a flower, folks will eat them. Uh, actually, by feeding them with these uh, dialog gates and different feeding ports, lime rinds and orange peels and apple cores, their bodies, uh, the crickets' bodies, take on that flavor. So uh, with that flavor, you can essentially tune the flavor of your um, powder and then make bagels that taste a little bit like apples or something like this. I highly recommend you taste crickets, uh, especially the ground-up versions. Uh, we, we've been to many uh, events where people from all different backgrounds have been a part of this, this project, coming up with different ideas. We have patented it. So there's a version I cannot show you because of uh, the patent pending process. Uh, but we are very serious about getting into the, the food business. What's really interesting is that the technology here isn't robots. It's not computers. It's not, uh, I mean, maybe it's biology, but it really is architecture that drove this technology. It is thinking carefully about the spaces and the units of our client, which was the cricket, and giving him the best possible life. And how do we know our client was happy? Well, they tend to do something called chirp, where they move their wings together, which is straddulation, and they make these uh, chirping sounds. And if the whole shelter is chirping and is alive, we feel fantastic. Those spiky parts that you've probably been wondering about are actually wind cowls that take vibrating columns of air when the crickets are chirping, and it magnifies it out through the shelter so you can hear this whole colony sing or chirp in unison. And these pods that we produced on the edge are uh, uh, what we call cricket sex pods. Here we're engaging the crickets uh, at close range between males and females so that they can meet each other and speak, uh, I don't know, in cricket language, whatever they say, to eventually go to little compartments and, and mate and produce more baby crickets. Uh, and that was fun to test those out, and they work. So I think they're super happy with what we produced. Anyway, that's uh, around 30 minutes, and that's just a sampling of the kind of the work uh, that we do at Terraform One. And I'm gonna kind of switch it over to, I guess, uh, myself if, uh, let me see if I can just do that. So if there's there's any quick questions, et cetera. Okay, okay, thanks very much, guys.